Think Tank with me, Steve Adubato, is brought to you by these public spirited organizations. TD Bank, New Jersey Sharing Network, dedicated to saving lives through organ and tissue donation. Community Food Bank of New Jersey. NJ Best, New Jersey's 529 College Savings Plan. Turn a dream into a degree. The Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. Johnson & Johnson. And by Choose New Jersey. Our mission is attracting companies to the Garden State. Promotional support provided by NJ Advance Media. And by ROINJ. Informing and connecting businesses in New Jersey. Welcome to Think Tank, the podcast. I'm Steve Adubato. The program you're about to see was taped earlier this year. Clearly, so much has changed since then, and unfortunately, a lot of uncertainty and fear remain. But the content in this Think Tank podcast and the issues explored will still matter once we get through these very difficult times together. Most importantly, we hope and pray that you and your family are safe. So without further ado, Think Tank, the podcast. Welcome to Think Tank, the podcast. I am Steve Adubato. We're coming to you from East Maid Media Studio. And in the studio, um, I want to welcome our good friend Jeanette Hoffman, who's a Republican strategist and president of Marathon Public Affairs, can be seen uh, every weekend on New Jersey Now on My9 and also Chasing News. Mm -hmm. On My9, 11 p.m. and Fox New York at 1 a.m. if you're still up. Good stuff. And by the way, since we're going to be talking about this very important issue of Women on the American political scene and the role of women, not only in New Jersey, but across the nation. And what the heck is going on and why aren't there more women in important, powerful positions? But one woman who's in a very powerful position is Nicole Swenerton, who is the senior producer of Think Tank, the broadcast, who's been pulled into on-air duty, if you will. How are you doing today? I'm doing pretty good. How about you guys? Doing great. Um, let me ask you this. Tell folks where they can find Think Tank, the podcast, if they're looking for not only this episode, but others. Sure. So to hear more Think Tank podcasts, you can subscribe on Apple Podcasts or Google Play, or you can visit our website at steveadubato.org. That's A-D-U-B-A-T-O. You can also follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato and on Facebook at Steve Adubato PhD to see more great content. Good stuff. We're about to listen to Debbie Walsh, the director of the Center for American Women in Politics at Rutgers. Um, I'm curious about this. There are of the 120 seats in the state legislature, right? Right. Of which I served for one very undistinguished term back in the <laughs> mid 80s. Very distinguished, I'm sure. Yeah, right. That's why I was unelected in 85 or 6, whatever it was. How about this? Only 37 I of know. the 120 members of the legislature are women? I know. It's Don't, so 2020, sad. 2020, what's up with that? It's so sad. We need to do better, Steve. Both parties. And I know you're going to single out the Republican Party, but no, both I know I'm not. <laughs> but what I am curious about is why is it so hard? Uh, it's hard. It's the county system and the party bosses. What does and that mean? Break that down for those Debbie's, who are not inside baseball. So Debbie's going to talk a little bit about this on the podcast. But it's the way the people who are in charge of getting the candidates to run for office, the people who are in charge of giving those candidates the money to run for office that select the candidates. It's an old boys network. It's the back room people sitting around smoking cigars saying, you're going to run for this, you're going to run for that. Still? It's mostly men. Of the 21 counties, there's a Republican county chair and a Democratic county chair. So that's 42 people. About nine of them are women. So mostly an old boys network. It is getting better. In my lifetime, I've, I've seen a lot more women get involved in the process. Um, I think it's generational. I think, you know, in the next 10 years, I think we're going to see those numbers increase. And I, I'm very optimistic and I'm very hopeful, but we all need to be doing better. When Mikey Sherrill was elected, again, it was significant. And I remember you were producing one of those shows with us. Does that inspire you when you see more women out there, A, and B, we just heard Jeanette talking about the numbers are not great in New Jersey. Loaded, I know, yeah. that question. I mean, someone like Mikey Sherrill is certainly inspiring. And to be one of the uh, two... By the way, excuse me, uh, on the other end of that same show is Holly Shapizzi, mm -hmm. a Republican. We talked about on one of other shows. Very inspiring as well. Go sure, ahead. I also really admire her as well. Um, and for Mikey Sherrill to be one of the two women in 
um, a, a, who is representative in the state of New Jersey out of 12, I think it's it's a, it's a big deal. And it's, um, it's just important for uh, young women to see someone like that in a leadership role. But I think what it really comes down to, going off of what Jeanette just said as well, is why won't men want to support women? And is it's, that a rhetorical question? I, I don't know the answer. Yeah, what's I, I mean, generational? It's, it's definitely generational. It I think is. that it comes down. It just comes down to. I mean, women have only been voting for a hundred years, so it's only been a couple generations since we've been able to have a real say in who we want to see in office. So I think that um, when men have been just controlling the system for so long, it's going to take. It's going to still take a lot longer to turn things, things around. Ready? Hillary Clinton, my mother, mom, I know you're listening right now to Think Tank, the, the podcast. She was so excited that Hillary Clinton was going to be the first woman president. And I used to say to her, Ma, I don't know. I'm not convinced that even most women like her. Now, the reason I'm saying that is that there are some who argued, A, that it would have been very significant, obviously, but that she wasn't the, quote, right woman. What the heck does that mean, the right woman? It Go wasn't ahead, because she was, was a woman candidate. She was just a bad candidate, Steve. She was just not the right Democratic candidate. And I'm not saying it was because she was a woman. She just had too much baggage, okay? She just wasn't ready. People wanted an outsider. I, they wanted Trump. They wanted Bernie. It wasn't her year. So uh, if it was a different woman, maybe she could have won the presidency. Well, let's but play this out I don't think bit. it was an anti-woman thing at all. Okay. I think she and she ran a bad campaign, but that's a whole nother story. Well, let's let's get into this. Personality matters, right? And I've said many times I, I wrote in my book Lessons in Leadership, which I will not plug on I'll plug on another show. Uh, I wrote extensively about Hillary Clinton's persona and the fact that she didn't connect with people on a personal level. So let me ask you this. Do you think from your sense, Nicole, that there's any difference in the way a woman is quote unquote likable, we've done a lot of programming on likability, versus a man running in public in public life from business. Is there a difference? Absolutely. And I think everybody knows that. It is Do we? Of course. What's the difference? Make the case. I mean, Hillary Clinton was criticized and and every basically every female candidate has been criticized for what they're wearing on stage, for how dressed up they are, for how their hair looks, for everything about them, the way that they run their families. I mean, it, it's everything. And I think that we all men are not criticized the same way. And it just makes it so much harder for people for women to convince men and women to support them. I should, I should say women as well. I, I would agree with Nicole. I think there is a double standard. It's just harder for women. But going back to what we said before, it's generational and it is getting better. What's changing? Then why are there only 37 of the 120 seats in the state legislature control? If it's getting better, but it's not even close to half. What was it 20 half. years ago, Steve? Right. It's it getting better. better. Look, that. my county chairman, Sean Golden, I'll put him on the spot. He's doing a great job recruiting what women to that? run. Monmouth. He's doing a great job recruiting women to run for office in the assembly, in the Senate. And, you know, he's looking at this holistically and saying, you know, if, if we have 51 percent women in Monmouth County, we should have 51 percent women representing us. And it's, it's not just at the state legislative levels. We need more women to run for uh, township mayors, board of, for education. board of education, for freeholders. You don't just start being a congresswoman. Mikey Sherrill's the exception who, exactly. who just ran for United States Congress. That's not this, the norm. I speak at you know the Ready to Run program that COP has that Debbie Walsh talks about. I speak at it every year and I say to women, if you want to run for office, you don't just send out your resume and say, I want to be CEO. No, you start from the bottom. You start running for township council. You start running for board of education. You know, that's how men start that way too. And sometimes a lot of women, you know, make that mistake saying, you know, I want to run. I'm running for Congress. No, you, you really got to start from the mm. bottom. You build your grassroots. You start raising money. And another issue that women have a really hard time doing is raising money. Men Harder than men. Trust me, I raise money every day for our production, and it's not it's easy. It's not you, easy. You think, but, but you think it's harder for women? It is harder for women. Why? We're Why not used different? to doing it. And we, you know what we're also not used to doing? Giving money to other women. We need to put money where our mouths are and give money to other women candidates. We need to support each other. Wow. Yep. Look, look at you. are like, yes. <laughs> right? like, I agree with all that. You know, our daughter, Olivia, who's nine, she's, she's involved with this group called uh, uh, Girls on the Run. Didn't we do a- Love we do Girls a, on the Run. Yeah, we did something, Girls on the Run. And every, every Saturday they get together, because we're doing this in the winter, and they're, they're yelling girl power. And I'm like- they're so strong. They're so tough. They're out there in terrible weather. And I'm thinking, awesome. these young women are the ones who are going to change things. And yeah. so in that spirit, that's why we have Think Tank. The podcast would do very strong women here. Uh, I want to, can we thank our funders again? Lauren, I should do that, right? 
If not, we don't have any money to pay for anything. Franklin Templeton, Choose New Jersey, the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, and Johnson & Johnson. I want to thank our friends at East Main Media Studio. Brian, everything good? Everything's great. And the Think Tank, the podcast is great because of folks like uh, Jeanette who come in and offer her analysis and commentary. Check her out every, virtually every day over on Fox 5 and My 9 on Chasing News and also uh, with our good friend Diane Doctor, who hosts on the weekends New Jersey Now. New Jersey Now, my Great. nine. And by the way, how much fun are you having working for the Caucus Educational Corporation as a senior producer of podcasts with an incredibly evolved CEO? Yeah, it's me. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's, isn't, isn't it having a lot of fun. Yes, yeah. this is all very exciting. By the way, let me make it clear that all our producers are women. <laughs> That's why the shows are good. Uh, so, Debbie. The most important woman in this particular case is Debbie Walsh, you're about to hear. She's the director of the Center for American Women and Politics at the great State University, which would be Rutgers University, and our football team will win one day, I swear. I just don't know when. Think Tank, the podcast. Check it out. I could feel my lungs fill with oxygen, and I got my life back. The sharing network means to me hope, life, and everything. The sharing network was a lifeline to me when I really needed it. We are an organ procurement organization. The core purpose of the New Jersey Sharing Network is to save and enhance lives. To honor those who gave. A tribute to those who received. Offer hope to those who continue to wait. And remember the lives lost while waiting. For the gift of life. This is Debbie Walsh, director of the Center for American Women and Politics at Rutgers University we were talking about. Let's disclose, previously we were both Eagleton and Fellows. Fellows, right, in the graduate program at the Eagleton Institute of Politics. Yes, I barely got in and barely got out. So uh, <laughs> let's do this, Debbie. Let's talk about women in politics. Um, women make up what percent of the population in New Jersey? About 51 percent in, in New Jersey and nationally. And in the state legislature in New Jersey, of the 100... And 20 members of that august body, there are how many women? About 31% of the legislature is female. 31? Uh, 31%. Because? Oh, so many reasons, Steve. Um, New Jersey has been a tough place for women to break in. Uh, I will tell you that at 31%, we're doing better than we have in a very long time. Uh, we rank 19th in the nation. Uh, we used to be, just a year ago, 13th in the nation, but when the elections happened in 2018 and we saw so many women getting elected across the country, even though New Jersey's numbers stayed the same, we dropped in our rank. Um, but we are doing better. It used to be 15 years ago, we were in the bottom 10 with Alabama and Mississippi. Um, and a lot of work has been done to try to increase the number of women in office in New Jersey. But there remain a lot of hurdles. And I think in large part, the greatest one is the party structure. Yeah, let's talk about this. Is it fair to say that most of the party leaders, the party structure, the party power brokers, those who you don't read about, well, put it this way, you don't see them on this show a lot, but they're the folks who make a lot of decisions about who gets to run. They're just middle-aged and older white men. Older white men. And if you look around the state on both sides of the aisle, um, I think it's only about nine women who are currently state party, uh, who are currently county party chairs. Right. Uh, the rest of them are all men. And those folks make a lot of decisions about who gets to run and, frankly, who doesn't get to run. Not always looking for women. Not always looking for women. And it's not necessarily a transparent process in New Jersey. Um, a lot of the times these decisions are made behind closed doors. And women are not in the room. We run a nonpartisan campaign training program called Ready to Run in New Jersey. We get close to 200 women every year who sign up, and they are ready to run. And they may think that they're in line, but sometimes the line moves, and uh, they don't know quite how to get there. Is the quote-unquote old boys network as alive and well and not so well for a lot of reasons as it was 15, 20 years ago? I think it's better Things have improved, but there is still, I think that what's improved is I think some of the men out there who run the show have realized that it's a good thing for them it's to run politics. women. It's smart politics to run women. But I think the men are still largely the folks making those decisions. Women aren't in the inside, um, in those back rooms when a lot of these decisions are made in most of the counties. Me Too made a difference? The Me Too movement made any difference? Has, has it made, in your view, any difference? in men who were involved in these decisions being aware enough, smart enough, practical enough, do the right thing, and put women out there. 
We'd like to think so. We'd like to think that this is having an impact here in New Jersey. I think it definitely has had an impact nationally. It has. I think we saw it in 2018 with record numbers of women running for office, state legislatures, Congress, and record numbers of women winning. Um, largely, almost exclusively on the Democratic side, Republican yep. women still have a long way to go. But here in New Jersey, I think it's been slower. We did, we did manage to go from one woman member of Congress in, from New Jersey to two. By the way, Mikey Sherrill, excuse me for sat right there, Congresswoman Sherrill. Check out that interview you did with her. And when she talked about how many women came in in this class. Yeah. In it this was, class in Congress. She said it's very refreshing. 36 women. It's the largest freshman class that we've seen of women. Uh, again, almost exclusively on the Democratic side of all of those newly elected women. One, one newly elected Republican woman last What's time. up with the Republicans? It's a complicated situation. So the Republican Party in general does not put the kind of resources into women's candidacies that the Democratic side does. Not just with the party itself, but outside organizations. There is nothing comparable to an EMILY's List pack for Democratic pro-choice women on the Republican EMILY's List, side. EMILY's List, that's a great way to raise money for women. Fantastic for way to raise money. <clears throat> But Trump. also on the Republican sorry, side, ahead. on the Republican side, there is a real reluctance to identify with the concept of identity politics. Huh? Well, their idea is on the Republican side is that the best candidate will rise to the top, whoever that is, and you don't necessarily need women or people of color to represent the interests of women. Well, how about and people representing the population? Yep, they'll say that the best candidates will come to the fore and that's how to do it. Um, Paul Ryan said when he was speaker that the reason there is the kind of partisan divide and gridlock in Washington, D.C. was because of identity politics. The Democratic Party embraces identity politics and that helps when it comes to recruiting women candidates. Let me ask you, someone listening, <clears throat> excuse me right now, saying, oh, uh, Debbie Walsh and Rutgers from the uh, American Women, excuse me, the Center for American Women and Politics of Rutgers, She's, she's speaking and she's clearly favoring the Democrats and is being critical of the Republicans. You say facts are facts? I say facts are facts, but I also say if we're ever going to get to political parity in this country for women, both parties have to do the work. And we need the Republican Party to do more. We need more Republican women in office. We need more women on both sides of the aisle. We're at about... We're still less than a quarter women in Congress, but the Democrats are doing much better. The Republicans need to do better. And the Democratic women in Congress tell us they want to see more Republican women in office, and the Republican women in Congress tell us Two the same left. thing. Is there a women's caucus? Is it real? There is a bipartisan caucus in Washington for women's issues that is not nearly as strong as it used to be. Uh, it is much harder these days for that kind of work across the aisle to exist. This is Debbie Walsh from the, she's the director of the Center for American Women in Politics at Rutgers University, my alma mater. They try to ignore that, but they can't. Uh, <laughs> thank we you. We claim to, you, we claim you. Yeah, once in a while, thank you. This is State of Affairs, I'm Steve Adubato. Let's continue the conversation. Follow me on Twitter at Steve Adubato. See you next time. Thank you very much. What is your child's dream for the future? Doctor? Teacher? Architect? Whatever they aspire to be, a college education may realize those dreams. And NJ Best can help. It's the college savings plan specifically designed for New Jersey families. Start saving today with as little as $25, because now is the time to invest in their future. To learn about NJ Best 529 College Savings Plan, its investment objectives, risks, and costs, read the Investor Handbook available at njbest.com. Highly educated and perfectly located in the heart of the Northeast Corridor, New Jersey provides access to top talent and one of the most concentrated and diverse consumer markets in the world. A business located in central New Jersey has access to more than 22 million consumers within a two-hour drive. Whether it's our strategic location, transportation systems, reliable utilities, or talented workforce, New Jersey has all you need to grow your business. To learn more, visit ChooseNJ.com. Think Tank with me, Steve Adubato, is brought to you by these public-spirited organizations. TD Bank, New Jersey Sharing Network, Community Food Bank of New Jersey, NJ Best, New Jersey's 529 College Savings Plan, the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, moving the region through air, land, rail, and sea, Kessler Foundation, and by Choose New Jersey. 
promotional support provided by NJ.com, small news, big news, true Jersey, and by R-O-I-N-J, informing and connecting businesses in New Jersey. Welcome to Think Tank, the podcast. I'm Steve Adubato. We're coming to you from East May Media Studios, uh, the beautiful studios here at East May Media. By the way, they produce a great show every Sunday on News 12 Plus at, Brian, you guys are on 11.30? 11 o'clock. Le- oh, <laughs> 11 o'clock. That's right. We're on at 10 with the leadership show and 10.30 with Think Tank, the podcast. You guys are on 11. And the name of the show is? Tap Into TV. I don't even know if we can see Brian. We just heard that. But check out Tap Into TV every Sunday at 11 o'clock on News 12 Plus. By the way, speaking of great broadcasters, Mary Gamba, who never expected to be on air, but you are. Yes, I know. Broadcaster. I'm going to add that to my resume title for sure. Yes. Um, and by the way, check out Mary every Sunday. Why I have a baseball because it's getting to be baseball season. As a Yankee fan, you know mm-hmm. they're going to win the World Series. Um, but Mary, Mary's on the co-host of the Lessons in Leadership show every Sunday. This is Think Tank, the podcast. Mary, on this show, talk about, it's just interesting. When I think about leadership, I also often think about resilience, mm-hmm. being tough. You're about to see an interview um, with Kelly Thomas, research participant, University of Louisville. We went up to the Kessler Foundation, our good friends and partners there. Mm -hmm. They are opening up, actually recently, opening up the Center for Spinal Stimulation, the Tim and Caroline Reynolds Center for Spinal Stimulation at Kessler Foundation. And this young woman, Kelly Thomas, we interviewed last, earlier in the year, Extraordinary. Absolutely extraordinary. So Kelly was in a car accident. Her car actually rolled over four times and she was paralyzed. And at that moment, she was told, you will never walk again. And thanks to the folks at the Kessler Center for Spinal Stimulation, as well as uh, the University of Louisville, she was a research participant there. They were actually able to put an epidural uh, stimulation device into her spinal cord. And then at the event that you were at, she was actually able to demonstrate how she could walk with a walker, moving her legs. And she is just some Somebody that overcame major adversity, and there's no telling where she's going to go. So, you know, for those of you who check out Think Tank, the podcast, because we examine public policy issues nationally, regionally, et cetera, that's great. But every once in a while here on uh, Think Tank, the podcast, which you can catch every Sunday at 1030 on News 12 Plus and other platforms as well, we want to do inspiring stories, people who make a difference. And even though we do a leadership show at 10 o'clock uh, on News 12 Plus, Uh, Kelly Thomas is a leader, by example. She's had it tough, but you couldn't tell from this interview. This is uh, Kelly Thomas on Think Tank, the podcast. That's Kelly Thomas, barrel racing in a rodeo. The Florida native was an active teenager riding horses, playing soccer, and working on the family farm. Then, disaster. July 2014. A car accident left Kelly paralyzed in a wheelchair with her doctor saying she would never walk again. Steve Adubato on location at Kessler Foundation. We're here for a very important forum, a discussion. It's called uh, Transforming Care and Recovery for People with Spinal Cord Injury. And uh, we're honored to be joined by one of the research participants here tonight. By the way, excuse the sound behind us. A lot of people want to be a part of this conversation. They want to listen and participate. So just bear with us. But Kelly Thomas is a research participant. Um, Kelly, in 2014, you were involved in a car accident. I was. Talk about the injuries. Um, Well, I have a C7, T1 spinal cord injury. Um, It's incomplete, so I have sensation, but I didn't have any motor. So my accident was a rollover motor vehicle accident. I ran off the shoulder of the road, flipped my vehicle four times, and was uh, hanging half in, half out of the vehicle whenever, thank God, a retired paramedic was walking his dog down the street and saved my life. You know, we were talking right before we got on the air and I asked Kelly about being a research participant. And you're gonna demonstrate something tonight, a very important uh, movement that was not possible how long ago? Um, Five years this year. And by the way, Kelly's a part of, uh, she's involved with epidural stimulation. Yes. And before I go back to how tough it was to make the decision to actually be a participant, explain to folks what epidural stimulation is. Um, So what the epidural stimulator is, is it's a spinal implant and the spinal electrode lays in my lower lumbar spine. And I have um, a battery that's actually implanted in my uh, lower abdomen, my lower left abdomen, and it has all the data in it 
that has different configurations that helps me facilitate movement. So many people have this epidural stimulator. It's a Medtronic device, um, and people use it for pain all the time to block the signals of, of pain. And I use it for movement. How much has it changed your life? Dramatically. How so? Dramatically. Um, well, I, whenever I suffered my spinal cord injury, I asked my neurosurgeon eye to eye. I said, what are my chances of ever walking again? And he said, uh, I won't say zero, but maybe one or two percent. And I said, okay, I'll be your one or two percent. And I worked and worked as hard as I possibly could. And I had made progress, but I kind of hit a plateau, hit a wall, and I needed something more. And this epidural simulator was available. And I moved to Kentucky for a year and a half, and I did what I was told I would never do again. And so now I'm able to go out into the community and walk, and it's fantastic being eye level with other people. Professionally, your background. Um, well, professionally, I'm an amateur. <laughs> Um, I'm a college student. Uh, I was actually going to school for physical therapy whenever I had my accident. Um, but I've changed my major, so I'm a criminal justice major. I, um, really? I'm a senior, yes, so I'll finish my uh, criminal justice degree in May, and um, I'll go to law school. You're going to law school. I am. You're going to become a lawyer. Yes. Any particular kind of law you want to focus on? Uh, criminal, criminal law. Criminal law. Yes. You were a little bit reluctant to become a research participant. I was. Because? I was afraid. I was skeptical. Uh, the other research participants at that time had not really reached a level of success that I was looking for. I wanted to walk. I wanted to do it. I wanted to be the biggest and best at it, kind of my nature. Um, so they had gotten one or two things back. You know, they had regained the ability to sweat, they could stand, but I wanted to walk and none of them at that point were walking and that what if got into my brain, what if I'm the one that figures it out? What if I'm the one that walks? Were you always this tough? Yes, I was <laughs> raised on a farm, I was raised by cowboys, so I was taught my whole life that you don't try at things, you do things. So. We are honored to have you with us tonight, oh, honored you. to listen to you share your experience, and we look forward to, uh, most importantly, your continued progress yes. and success. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. That's powerful stuff from uh, Kelly Thomas. I want to thank Kelly and also the folks at uh, Kessler Foundation and the Center for Spinal Stimulation up at Kessler Foundation. Uh, Mary, by the way, let's thank our funders who made Think Tank the podcast absolutely, possible. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, Atlantic Health System, Johnson & Johnson, Franklin Templeton, as well as Suez. That's right. By the way, we would not be able to do what we do if, we're, if, not, if it were not for those generous corporations and foundations who support us. So every Sunday you catch... Think Tank, the podcast right here on News 12 Plus at 1030. And by the way, right before that, 10 o'clock is Lessons in Leadership. And uh, make sure you check out Brian and his team doing Tap Into TV every Sunday at 11 o'clock on News 12 Plus. I'm Steve Adubato. This has been Think Tank, the podcast. Thank you for watching. But most importantly, what do I say, Mary? Think for yourself. Yeah, no, don't. I'll think for myself. You think for yourself. Yes. Catch you next time. I could feel my lungs fill with oxygen, and I got my life back. The Sharing Network means to me hope, life, and everything. The Sharing Network was a lifeline to me when I really needed it. We are an organ procurement organization. The core purpose of the New Jersey Sharing Network is to save and enhance lives. To honor those who gave. Pay tribute to those who received. Offer hope to those who continue to wait. And remember the lives lost while waiting. For the gift of life. You may not have heard of TAVR. Raj and Sandhya have. It's the minimally invasive alternative to open heart valve replacement. RWJ Barnabas Health is New Jersey's leading TAVR provider, and we continue to perfect it. Patients are often back to their lives in just a few days. Innovative valve replacement surgery, because you can't be replaced. RWJ Barnabas Health, let's be healthy together. Think Tank with me, Steve Adubato, is brought to you by these public-spirited organizations.
TD Bank, New Jersey Sharing Network, Community Food Bank of New Jersey, NJ Best, New Jersey's 529 College Savings Plan, the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, Kessler Foundation, and by Choose New Jersey. Promotional support provided by NJ.com and by R-O-I-N-J.